You want to know something funny? A sentence from this episode became a meme and people even made stickers out of it. Okay, that's not true. But if someone could pull off something like that, it would surely be Chelsea Parlet Pellerity. Indeed, Chelsea's research focuses on using statistics and machine learning on behavioral data, but her more general goal is to empower people to be able to do their own statistical analysis through consulting, education, and, as you may have seen, stat memes on Twitter. A full-time teacher, researcher, and statistical consultant, Chelsea earned an MSc and PhD in computational and data science in 2021 from Chapman University. Her courses include R, Intro to Programming in Python, and Data Science. In a nutshell, Chelsea is, by her own admission, an avid lover of anything silly or statistical. Hopefully, this episode turned out to be both at once. I'll let you be the judge of that. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 46, recorded June 29, 2021. <music> Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash stats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like their private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash stats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. chelsea paulet pelleriti welcome to learning bayesian statistics thank you happy to be here yeah um uh, thanks a lot i'm i'm really glad to finally have you on the show because you were a bit already on the show when i was um talking with uh, I think it was Michael Badencourt. Oh yeah, or yeah, Lee. Michael Badencourt. Oh yes, oh, yes. I, there's two yeah, exactly. Michael's invasion statistics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, but it was Michael Lee that uh, you referred yeah. uh, Michael Lee to me on Twitter yeah. and I hosted Michael on LBS for episode 31 and we had a fascinating talk about uh, Bayesian cognitive modeling yeah. and, and decision making. So, yeah, that like we thanked you during the episode, but again, and live <laughs> this time. Uh, thanks again for, for this uh, referral and, and a great episode. Of course. Yeah, he's wonderful. And now, yeah, 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 exactly. And, uh, and now I'm really happy to to have you on the show we're gonna talk about the very diverse topics because you do a lot of different things and uh, i love that that always makes for a, an exciting conversation and then i hope episode for listeners but as usual i like to start with your background so maybe tell us for how long you have been into stats and yeah what's your story basically yeah well i would probably be relatively new based on most people's timelines. I didn't start loving statistics until the end of my undergraduate career, which is getting further and further away, <laughs> but was still like 2015. <laughs> yeah. So maybe about six years, if I'm doing my math correct. And I wasn't a Bayesian yet then, but I took a lot of statistics for my psychology degree, which is what my undergraduate degree is in fell in love, but didn't have time to get all of the classes necessary to get another degree in statistics. Mm -hmm. So I just went for it and decided to teach a lot of it to myself, to take classes outside of my university degree, to audit classes from awesome people like Michael Lee, and kind of transition myself from research psychology to statistics, and then officially transitioned, I suppose, on paper 
during the application process to graduate school and then did my PhD in computational and data science. So technically, my degree program is quite diverse in the range of students that it covers. So my specialty within computational and data science is clearly (laughs) inferential statistics and machine learning. But, you know, people do everything from physics to more applied methods. So that is, in a very short nutshell, my story of how I got into stats relatively recently compared to most people. (laughs) Yeah, I love to see this diversity uh, in the podcast where you have people who have been into stats for a long time from a young age or and you can also see that even more with uh, programming, mm. actually. Like you have people who have been programming since they were uh, very <laughs> young. Like recently I interviewed Remy Louf and he has been programming since he was 11. So oh my goodness. Uh, he's good. And I started programming when I was 27. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, okay, <laughs> so you've got a, a few years. You're a few years ahead of me. <laughs> And I find that to be the the beautiful thing of this ecosystem is that you have very young statistician statisticians, very old statisticians in the in the number of years they have been been doing that. And you also have people who went into that with quite a lot of serendipity, which is a bit uh, your case, actually, right? Yeah, I definitely didn't plan on it. I thought I was going to be a lawyer for a while, Mm -hmm. then (laughs) didn't go down that path. Although I started studying for the LSAT, so I was clearly a little bit interested. But I mentioned that I fell in love with statistics at the end of my university career. And that was because I took an advanced stats course. It's, it probably covers basic stats 101, but compared to what we had been covering in psychology, stats was advanced. And I took it to get into graduate school. And my professor was so excited about statistics that it was contagious. And I fell in love with it, not planning to at all. And like I said, it was the last year of my uh, undergraduate degree. So I was a little like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, this might be a career change for me. And it was, and it took a couple of years, but it ended up working out. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I love the the fact that, um, you know, it, it also depends on professors and and the people you you meet, it's 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 both a good thing and a and a bad thing, I guess. Then because if you don't meet this professor, this professor on your path, maybe you end up being a lawyer. Yeah. And so I'm guessing that some people would love statistics, but they just don't know that. But at the same time, like you have this kind of again this serendipity, which uh, has its its own charm, and it just like. You discover that kind of uh, yeah, by chance, and but also it, I think it also highlights the fact that um, teaching in general, but teaching statistics maybe even more, like relies a lot on the enthusiasm and I don't know just the, the happiness of doing what he's doing of your professor. It's like it's something we talked about with Alan Downey actually and. Yeah, just having someone who is very enthusiastic about what he does and actually shows you why that's interesting and what you can do with that. I think it's the main motivation. Like it's like the, you know, the concrete motivation. Okay. What can I apply that to? Then that makes a huge difference in, in how you learn and then you end up sticking with it or not. Yeah. I, took statistics a lot before that class that changed my mind. And I think the main difference, you know, from high school, we did AP statistics all the way to the undergraduate courses I took. The difference the last time was that everyone before that didn't truly understand why we did statistics. In high school, the teacher was clearly just teaching for the AP test, didn't really apply it to research or anything like that. And in undergrad, it seemed like, you know, here's some buttons you can push so that we can publish our data that we care about. The last stats class I took in undergrad was really 
different because it was like, no, this process is beautiful. This is a really cool tool that we have and had some passion about the application rather than seeing it as like a hurdle to publication or something that they were required to teach for an AP test. I can completely relate to that. And yeah, it's in, in, an, in a way that's, you know, the old love their journey and not only the, the end. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you have to do statistics to get your results. So you might as well <laughs> enjoy it and make the most out of it because you won't get around it. So you might as well do it. And, and if you do that from a, a place of um, intellectual curiosity, it will make your life much easier. <laughs> And, and more, more interesting fun. too, I think. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's also like I really love doing that in the podcast, but also in my in my writing. Because I have like I have one of my personal fights for a long time has been that there is kind of this, you know, unspoken assumption, at least in the French educational system. I don't know how it is in the US actually. That's interesting. But in the French educational system, but also in like, you know, corporate world that to be serious, you have to be kind of boring, you know, and it's like to be boring demonstrates seriousness. Like you can't joke with serious topics uh, or you can't have, you know, like, yeah, just be a bit more relaxed about what you're talking about than trying to draw funny comparisons, etc. And I know this will interest you because that's exactly what you're doing. For instance, on Twitter, you do that a lot. And that's also something I'm, I'm very attached to and, and try to do because I actually think this is completely backwards. It's not because some, like it's, to me, it's uncorrelated. It's not because something is serious that you can't explain it with enthusiasm and, and humor. And on the contrary, uh, doing that helps the memory. Because then, uh, like, if you have striking examples uh, with some puns and some funny stories, well, it helps people remember them instead of having, okay, so base theorem is blah, blah, blah. It is used for in that, and you have to learn that by heart. I hate that. And also, I find it, um, you know, it, it empties also kind of the, the scientific process also because like, Base formula actually has a whole history and a very interesting and fascinating history. And so to help people relate more to the scientific method and how actually scientific discoveries come up, I find that super important to actually relate them to the history of how this came about, like this didn't came from nowhere and in exactly the, the form that we know it today. You know, it's it's a long, sinuous road to where we are. And so, yeah, I like to talk about that. And I'm, I'm curious if you noticed that too, maybe in the, in the corporate world, if you saw some lawyers, etc. <laughs> I mean, in France, definitely like that, like you can't really have a, have a funny pun or something like that in a presentation that immediately makes you completely not credible in front of your audience. Wow. Yeah, that's not been my experience. I think there are some people that think that you have to be, what's a good word for it? Maybe like opaque. Like if you are too approachable, they feel like you're not rigorous, you're not serious. But I feel like academics here is very the opposite. My friends and I will spend hours crafting puns for titles in our conference presentations, <laughs> especially our lectures if you're working with undergraduates. And even I was just pulling up, Michael Baincourt wrote a new case study on sparsity. And mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure he titled it Sparsity Blues. And there are more puns throughout. And I just think that's very a very good example of how it's more accepted because you can call Baincourt's work many things, but not rigorous is not a thing <laughs> that you could say about his yeah. work. So to also include like levity and humor there, I think is a good example for people who maybe do have that assumption that humor means you're not serious. I would say like, I've obviously I do a lot of humor. In fact, you could say that's all I do <laughs> in science communication and Yeah, I think it's really good. And you were mentioning it helps with memory. And to be more specific about that, I've said this multiple times, but I think that 
it reduces the cognitive load for people who are trying to learn something that is admittedly confusing and difficult at times. But when you use humor, you're both disarming someone and making them feel more comfortable, which helps. But more specifically, I've sort of chosen some of the mediums that I use like TikTok or memes for the reason that they provide scaffolding and structure outside of the context of statistics, but that can help you communicate statistics ideas. So for example, if you have a meme that is well known and you present it to an audience who would be familiar with the structure of that joke or that meme or that TikTok format, you can put on top of it a difficult concept like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or what is Bayes' theorem or anything like that. And because they have the structural scaffolding from whatever the format of the meme or the TikTok is, you're kind of benefiting from that structure and allowing them to learn something that maybe they would have found less approachable or more difficult without the scaffolding of that joke or meme format that you used. Hmm. I guess uh, we're already talking about stuff I had planned for <laughs> later in the episode, but you know, I love randomness. <laughs> but so, so yeah, we'll definitely talk about that more later on. But first though, so it, it does sound like it's something that that's really deliberate to you that like you do that on, on purpose and, and consciously, but I'm wondering how you started and like what made you start communicating in that way and how, like basically how did, how did that come up and, and how did you understand that? Okay. Maybe that's efficient. Maybe I should do more of that. Yeah. Well, I started just because I've always been inspired by. I wouldn't say directly educational materials, but educational adjacent materials like The Phantom Tollbooth or similar books that really don't take themselves too seriously, but are really good at exploring ideas and concepts. And so when I started writing, I took that approach to it just because that was my sense of humor. And I think I had a bit more of a more of a dry, controlled, less chaotic sense of humor that I do now. But I was really mimicking those types of sources because that's what I really enjoyed growing up. And so I would write things like that and then it got more attention or I would write for someone or a company and kind of see the things that people resonated the most with. And I think that has subconsciously shaped what I do or like the types of formats that I use, but it really was inspired organically by the types of things that growing up, I really enjoyed learning from. That's interesting. Okay. And, and we'll come back to that, but uh, maybe let's go back to, <laughs> to actually what a bit more about you. I'm wondering how you would define what you're doing nowadays, because you work on a lot of different topics. What are you doing nowadays and how useful are patient statistics there? I don't even know how to define what I do. I, <laughs> yeah. it's a little bit, well, it's fun for me and it's a bit interesting because I am a full-time faculty member uh, teaching. So research is something that I have a lot of control over because I'm not on a tenure track. So I feel like describing what I do now statistically is very much in line with what a consultant would do. I'm brought into various projects to help them do better or more complicated statistical methods. So I don't necessarily think that I have a specific focus the way that a tenure track stats researcher would. I tend to focus on applying machine learning and statistical methods to behavioral data. So psychology, which is my background and all of my friends and collaborators <laughs> field. So I focused, for instance, in my dissertation on unsupervised machine learning and Bayesian models, applying them to situations in which people don't often use them. And so in my case, it was a specific task in the meta memory field. And so I would say that my main goal is to improve the way that people do statistical methods in other fields and improve the communication. Because oftentimes 
there will be something that all statisticians just generally know or are aware of and agree upon that we don't communicate to anyone else. <laughs> so you get to a field like psychology who maybe doesn't always have that direct connection with the statistics world. And, you know, they're doing something like stepwise regression for an inferential model, whereas almost every statistician would say there's a lot better methods out there that you could use, but we haven't communicated that to them. So they're still using stepwise regression. And I think that's a good way to illustrate what I do is to kind of help connect those fields to bring better methods to people who want them. <laughs> but Bayesian statistics, back to your question, is incredibly useful there because I think that most researchers are taught frequentist methods only. And it's not portrayed in a way that like, hey, here's a tool that's really common and we're teaching it to you because you're going to see it a lot. It's portrayed as like, this is statistics and like, this is the way that the statistical field has developed, which I suppose is to some degree true because until we had computational resources, we couldn't use <laughs> fancy sampling algorithms. But I find that when people learn about Bayesian statistics, they realize that it is a better fit for the types of questions that they're asking. And I won't say that frequentist statistics is never the answer, but I think in many cases, people aren't even aware that there are other tools. And so they're being introduced to Bayesian statistics and going like, oh, like this makes more sense for the type of work I'm doing. So that has always been the case for me and almost all... I'll say almost nearly all the models in my dissertation work, for example, are Bayesian models, just because that fit better the types of questions that I was answering, because I didn't need a null hypothesis significance test in almost every case. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I'm guessing that th there are quite a lot of people who are in need of Bayesian statistics, but they don't know mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an unknown unknown, <laughs> if you want. It's like, they, they have problems with their model currently and they don't know how to solve that with the toolbox they got. And there is something that could help them, but they just don't know about it. And so back to communication, I think that's why it's also super important to have people communicate about that like you. And that's also what I try to do on the podcast is to help people discover about these tools. You know, some, like for instance, uh, someone working in the psychology, field will hear or will listen to your episode and be like, oh, okay, maybe that's something I could use because I, ex I have exactly the same problem as Chelsea and she solved that with, I don't know, mixed effect models. Of course, always a mixed effect model. <laughs> exactly. And so that's actually something that we talked about quite a lot in episode 40 with uh, Alison Hilger and, and Timo Rodger who do speech sciences. And yeah, they, they basically encountered Bayesian statistics, mainly through Paul Bruckner's work mm -hmm. on BRMS and, and the, the, the work he does, like popularizing these methods in different papers, in different scientific papers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's basically, as you were saying, a statistician talking to non-statisticians in non-statisticians way and outlets, basically. Yeah. I feel like it's really super important if if we want these methods which are actually <laughs> useful in i don't know a numerous ways as you said they just like we just have to make people aware of them and then they will see for themselves whether it's it's useful or not but often as you say people just don't know about them like just they don't know yeah i, lo I really love that part and also, another thing that I, I thought about when you were answering this question is, okay, you took, I actually take that example for, for people exactly in this case, you were talking about stepwise regression to some inference and you were saying that, oh, actually you should maybe use something else. What would you say in, the, in this case, in this example? Yeah, it's really difficult because it depends a little bit on what your goals and restrictions are with your data. So I don't have a perfect answer mm -hmm. and I wish I did because every time I joke about stepwise regression on Twitter, for example, everyone asks that. They're like, well, what should I use? And I list like 10 different yeah. things and say, well, like here's a bunch of options. I don't know which one is going to fit. You can take like, 
a common example, yeah. like maybe the model example. Yeah. So, I mean, I would always recommend or have been recommending in terms of accessibility of methods, because you have to think both about what would theoretically be the best method to use for this question, but also what is available to the people that are using it. So my suggestion is often to use lasso, which is basically a form of regularization, which in itself is a form of Bayesian statistics because it's like putting a prior on your regression coefficients. That is often a really good way in the context of like mostly frequentist statistics because there are packages developed there I forget what it's called I think it's called something like selective inference um, but there are packages in R and Python that you can apply corrections to p-values which is mostly what people are looking for when they're doing a selective inference and, and looking at sparse models so that tends to be my number one suggestion in terms of accessibility. For people who are willing to dig a little deeper, I'm still new to this, but my number one, like, if you need sparse models is to use Bayesian regularization, not just in the form of lasso or ridge, which is like putting a prior on your coefficients, but methods like the spike and slab, can't say that correctly, or horseshoe priors that actually regularize the entire density of your posterior distribution. The article that I mentioned that Michael Badencourt just put in with all his puns is about this, and I haven't finished it yet. So I don't want to give you a solid recommendation because whatever he says is much more well thought out than what I've said. But those types of methods tend to be like my gold standard. But I often am working with people for whom that would be like an unclimbable barrier. And so things like lasso with corrections is a really good stepping stone to at least not be doing stepwise. Yeah. And maybe quickly, um, tell us why and when people do stepwise regression and Maybe what it is in a in a nutshell. Yeah. Because like for instance, I never use that, so I don't oh, even good, know when, good. You when people use that. Oh, good, good. You skipped the whole problem. Um, yeah. So stepwise regression is a way to do variable selection. So if you have more variables in your model okay. than you would like to have, then you often use something to induce sparsity in your model, where you're dragging the coefficients of those things to zero. And stepwise regression is a way of putting things in a model, there's actually multiple forms of it, but generally you're putting things in a model and testing, like, is there anything else that I could put in here that would be better for the fit of the model? And you'll use something like the p-values or the AIC to choose which is best at every single step, which is in itself problematic. <laughs> and then also yeah, has that yeah. selective inference problem, because if you think about most people will do stepwise regression or even lasso and they will choose the variables that are in their model because obviously both stepwise and lasso induce sparsity in your models. And then they'll just run that model with typical methods and report the p-values and the confidence intervals. But those don't account for the cherry picking that you did in selecting the best variables for that situation. And so when I say lasso with corrections or even the paper I was mentioning with the selective inference package, I believe can also correct for inference and stepwise regression, but it takes into account the fact that you are selecting the best variables so that it corrects the p-values and confidence intervals to be a little bit less biased because of that selection. Yeah, okay, I guess that, and, oh yeah, that hurt me when you, <laughs> uh, when you described why people were doing stepwise regression. <laughs> okay, that actually rings a bell. Uh, we talked about that a bit with uh, Aki Vettari when he came uh, to the show, and he's actually working a bit on that. And he's got like, he's helping developing a package with other people, which is called uh, ProSpread, based on Stan, of course. And that's doing a projection predictive variable selection. Mm. And so that performs projection predictive variable selection for generalized linear models. Ooh. And you can use that mostly with R stand arm. And yeah, they, they, uh, I think Paul Bjorkner is also working on that. And yeah, I would encourage people to take a look at that because then that's a fully Bayesian package and method, of course. And yeah, they, they do, like it's, it's a well-rounded work, very interested. Unfortunately, only in, only in R for, for now, but um, really, really interesting to take a look at and much more robust and statistically safe than stepwise regression from what I understood. Well, that's a low bar for <laughs> something to be more <laughs> better than <laughs> yeah. 
stuff wise. Yeah, I put that in the I put a link to Prosh Pride in the in the show notes for people who are interested. That's definitely a great work. So I'd encourage listeners to to take a look and of course listen to Aki's episode on Learn Based Stats. Actually, I, I didn't ask you that question yet, but I ask it to to everybody who comes to the show. Do you remember when you personally first got introduced to Bayesian stats, by the way, and why were they attractive to you? I do remember, probably because I am such a baby statistician that it's only been <laughs> less than a decade. I got introduced to it very briefly in undergrad. I realized I love statistics, was reading more about it, and someone mentioned Bayesian statistics. And I said, oh, that sounds very exciting. And I actually took it to my professor at the time, who is the one that was amazing and actually I'm still in contact with. He's wonderful. And I said, hey, have you heard of this Bayesian statistics thing? I thought at the time that it was new, like someone had just come up with it. Little did I know <laughs> <laughs> the history. And he actually said, oh, I don't like those methods. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just trusted him implicitly because he was so influential in my early career and came to UCI where I worked as a lab and data manager for a couple of years before graduate school, which is where I met your esteemed guest, Michael Lee. And his, I see where you're going with yes, it. Yes, and his pod of uh, Bayesian cognitive scientists. And so I, you know, he was very influential both on me and in my lab in general. You know, whenever we talk about Bayesian methods, we talk about Joachim and Michael or Alex Etz t talking about their type of Bayesian statistics and how cool and sexy it was because it really was presented, at least in the psychology world, as this like highbrow, very cool <laughs> thing that you could do. And so I was obviously drawn to it just because of that. And also because Michael and Joachim are amazing teachers who let me audit some of their classes, which is so kind of them. And so I learned about it through them, which is also interesting because they tend to focus, at least in my understanding, on Bayesian hypothesis testing, which is very well suited to what psychologists think they want because that's what we're used to. So that was my, you know, entry foray into that. Michael usually teaches in JAGS, or at least he did at the time that I was working with him. And then obviously JASP was something that was really cool and fancy and new at the time. So I learned about it and I just thought, well, this makes a lot more sense to me. It really struck me as like, wow, okay, you know, I've spent a lot of my two or three years in statistics trying to explain to my psychology friends what null hypothesis significance testing is. And they were always so confused about it because it is inherently kind of confusing. And when I learned Bayesian statistics, I said, no, that makes sense. You should just compare the likelihood of two models and choose the one that is more likely and combine that with your prior information. So it just made more sense. And it also made things easier because when you report credible intervals or things like that, they mean more closely to what the public thinks they mean compared to something like a confidence interval. And I'm just reminded of this every single time I read someone try and explain introduction to statistics through NHST is that they're just making so many caveats and you have like 10 sentences to just try and explain what this confidence interval that we got in our analysis means. And when you have a Bayesian method and reporting a credible interval, you're just like, there's a 95% chance that the true population parameter is in this interval. And that's literally all that you have to do. And so it really attracted me in that sense. And then when I was diving into Bayesian statistics a little more, discovered the magic that is Bayesian parameter estimation, <laughs> which met a lot more of the needs of the types of questions I was asking compared to hypothesis testing. So it was like a slow trickle from, you know, Michael Lee and JASP <laughs> all the way into being a Stan obsessed Bayesian parameter estimation person. <laughs> yeah, I love that path. And yeah, it again, makes a ton of sense. And again, you were attracted to practical benefits of the patient methods, as a lot of people are, instead of the philosophical side, which is something that's fascinating, but that you discover after. Right. And Michael, if you're all listening to us, well done. <laughs> and thanks for introducing uh, Chelsea to patient methods. <laughs> 
actually you, like very quickly but you mentioned that right now so you're mainly you're mainly using R and Stan right when you work on a Bayesian model yes so R and Stan is my go-to. I've actually been meaning to do more Python and Stan because the Stan code is the same. It's just the implementation in Python that's a little different. So I'm actually looking to do more of that, maybe streaming it or doing something to show people how difficult it is, even when you know R and Stan so well to switch to Python. But yes, I use that. And then, of course, I'm a huge Paul Berkner fan. So the BRMS package is one of my go-tos, more so when I'm either doing kind of exploratory modeling or introducing someone new to Bayesian statistics, because I... I'm a little bit of a control freak, so I do really like the stand syntax of being able to control every yeah. single thing. But I am not going to lie, I often will run like the BRM function for a model that I want, grab the stand code using get stand code, and then edit it myself because I think they have just a really wonderful structure of translating that typical LM syntax into a Bayesian model. But yeah, that is my typical workflow, of course, using things like tidy bays or whatever for plotting. But Stan is by far my favorite. I've used pretty much every common Gibbs sampler <laughs> out there. And while they are very speedy, I find that Stan is just a little bit better built for the things that I'm trying to do. And of course, there's all of the theoretical, you know, differential geometry reasons to use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which as far as I'm aware, Stan is the only major package to do that. But I use it for more pragmatic reasons. I think that I think it's just like a beautiful syntactic experience <laughs> when you're coding all your models. Yeah, yeah, I can guess that. <laughs> I started learning Bayesian statistics with PMC and so like when you detail all your model in the code then you can't really go back and use something that's more black boxy and I'm not I was not even very used to the LM syntax so I mean to me it was really a no-brainer but then when you start having all your like really all the all the steps of your model in the code you don't want to give that up. Yes. Oh, it's something like, <laughs> I can't do that anymore. Well, uh, it's the same thing for, for Git, you know, the Git workflow. I started on the command line and no, I always lose the command line because otherwise it's just, I freak out, you know, I'm like, wait, did, did that check out the right branch? Did I push to the right repo? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Never, yeah. I think it's funny too, because I've learned more in depth about statistical models by using Stan than any other package. And I gave an example actually in my dissertation talk, and I think I've posted this on Twitter, that using Stan really shined a light on the similarity between logistic regression and beta regression for me. Because in one of my papers, I jokingly call it logistic three ways because we use a cumulative logit model, a logistic regression, and beta regression, all which have some form of logistic <laughs> distribution in there. And it really was interesting to me because I was coding for one data set, there was two separate questions we were asking, one that used logistic because there was a binary outcome and one that used beta because it was a proportion outcome. And when I was coding the models, I realized these are exactly the same. There are like two lines when defining the likelihood that are different and that's it. They're basically the same thing. You're just, you know, giving a beta likelihood or a <laughs> Bernoulli or binomial, depending how, how you set up your model. And I really enjoyed learning that. And then a similar thing happened with another one of my papers. We're using item response theory and Bayesian item response theory. And building that model really gets you to go, oh, this is just logistic regression <laughs> with a slight complication on top. And so I really love, though I understand for people just beginning, it is very intimidating. I love building my models like that because I think it gives you a bit of a deeper intuition to how all of these models that we use and view as discrete items are actually incredibly similar and well-connected. Yeah, completely agree again. Although I do see the, the value of... Um, things like BRMS yeah. in R or and Bambi, in, and Bambi yeah. in Python. Not something I, I go to and not something I used to learn, but I can clearly see a path of people used to frequentist packages, syntax, picking a BRMS or Bambi. And then after a while, 
because they need it, because their model is particularly complicated, writing the full model in PyMC3 or in Stan. Yeah. That's kind of the the channel, uh, if you're the funnel, <laughs> if you want. The marketing funnel, as we say in, in startups. No, yeah. I agree because they're they're like a beautiful link between what people are used to and then the full on coding your own Stan code. Yeah. I mean, I've used them all the time. So it's not like every time I run a Bayesian analysis, I'm writing <laughs> Stan code from scratch. But yeah, I think it, it gives you a lot of power because you can change a lot of things, but it will do a lot of things by default for you, which is helpful when you're kind of overwhelmed with everything that comes with choosing priors and like doing a Bayesian analysis for the first time. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's less overwhelming and, and I can clearly see the value in there because otherwise you have to be, if you just start trying out Bayesian stats and you're so overwhelmed, you're going to get, you know, beginner's paralysis and yeah. you're going to quit. You have to be very motivated and really want to use Bayesian stats if you start with row stand code or or yeah else. would not um, recommend if so, anyone's listening and thinking of doing that don't start with raw stand code i think you'll <laughs> die <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah but and you can clearly see your your point maybe before moving on to another question you're mentioning a beta regression do you mean like so you mean a beta binomial regression or is it something else? Yeah, so like beta regression in the way that I'm talking about it is basically, actually, as I was mentioning, like logistic regression, but instead of your likelihood saying that we're going to have a 0-1 binary outcome, you're having anything non-inclusive between 0 and 1. And so you have a beta likelihood. So when you have your predicted error, your beta likelihood is saying that, you know, it's a continuous value bounded between 0 and 1. And our error is based on a okay. beta um, distribution. But what's really interesting is, as I mentioned, just in case anyone hears that and goes, that would be perfect. Usually in most of the cases in, for instance, psychology that I am applying these methods in, you do have zeros and ones. Beta regression cannot handle this. So you actually have to use what I lovingly call Zoidberg. Most people call it Zoib, but zero one inflated beta regression which is a mixture model. So it's a good way to get people into mixture models if you like that. And you basically have a probability that something's a zero, a probability that it's one, and a probability that it's a beta distributed variable between zero and one. So if anyone is, for instance, going to go <laughs> explore that, check out Zoib because I think it's more practical in a lot of the situations that people will actually want to apply that model. Okay. And, then, and so that means that your observations... Like you have, like in psychology, for instance, your data, your observations are between they were zero and one inclusive. or inclusive exactly. or exclusive, Which, depending on the case. But to do that, do beta regression, you need that. Right, right, because beta regression doesn't actually accept those values. But it's yeah. interesting, I think, because in my case, at least zeros and ones meant something quite special because we were using Briar scores on a certain task. So zero meant like perfect and one meant okay. you suck the most you could possibly suck. So it is really interesting too because you can technically model the mixture components based on like variables that you have observed from people like age or mm -hmm. experience or something like that. So it's a very interesting model. I won't dive into it here because it's it's... <laughs> probably boring for most people. Yeah. But yes, highly recommend zero one inflated beta regression because often you have zeros and ones. And the other way to do it is to like scale your data between zero and one to make it so that like you add a little bit of noise basically. Don't do that. Just use zero one inflated beta regression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's interesting. I think I've never used a model mm. that like needed a model with a beta likely mm, you should try it sometime it's fun <laughs> yeah yeah i need some data give me some data and i will but uh, yeah okay so it's like for prior scores or stuff like that which are between zero and one okay uh, that's funny maybe do you have um, a resource that we can put in the show notes for people if you if they want to discover a zero one inflated beta regression? Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't have a ton of good resources when trying to build my models. I recently read something and I'm forgetting because it was someone very big in the Bayesian world and I don't remember if it was like... <sighs> Matt Viore, I don't know how to say his last name. I think someone like that just put out 
an article or just promoted recently an article on zero one inflated beta regression, but I don't remember <laughs> who it was, but I can find that for you and you can link it in the show notes. Yeah, uh, definitely. If you can, if you can do that, that'd be great. Okay. I had, I have other questions about the uh, psychology data <laughs> and so on, but time is flying by and I want to talk about the uh, stats education a bit. So, because I know it's one of your favorite topics. So like in general, very general question, but I'm wondering from your experience, what can you tell us about best practices to teach patients stats? That's a great question. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about that because I've only taught it really not in the classroom because in, in my department, I'm teaching mostly like predictive modeling. Although I sneak some bays in there because we teach regularization and I think regularization is a great gateway drug <laughs> to full on Bayesian modeling. But in terms of how I've tried to write about it and create materials for the public, I think that you have to know what you're talking about really well so that you can get rid of all of that noise that there is. Because as we were talking about previously, it can be really overwhelming to build a Bayesian model from scratch, especially if it's not something that you're doing all the time. I mean, I get overwhelmed. I am constantly forgetting to put priors on my models when I write stan code. And I do this all the time. So I think you have to really know what is important and focus on that. Because when you have something where the Bayesian framework really forces you to thoughtfully choose a lot of parameters, a lot of options for the structure of your model. You have to be able to say, okay, which of these is most important when you're teaching someone how to do this? And so that's why I love for teaching. I almost exclusively use the BRMS package or a little bit Bambi, but I don't know that very well. So I haven't used it a lot because it allows you to give people a little bit of the theoretical backings of Bayesian models without forcing them to specify every single thing, which I remember from learning Bayesian statistics and even from my current <laughs> practice of it can be just way too much and can even kind of stand in the way of you using a Bayesian method when really it might be the best choice for you. So using things like humor, using things like, relate, uh, like highly relatable examples has been in my opinion, the best way to kind of get people in the door. So between that and then talking about things that people already understand, for instance, that regularization, you can just say, oh, regularization, we all think that's really cool. You can actually do that with tons of other things because that's basically a form of priors. Or another good example is people are often in research, at least really interested in mixed effect models. And random effects are quite Bayesian in the way that they work. And so you can use that as a jumping off point to say, hey, you know how random effects work with partial pooling? Wouldn't it be cool if we did that for everything <laughs> and then get them on board to kind of do some more Bayesian statistics from a point that they're a little more comfortable and familiar with? Yeah, completely get that. That's interesting. I like that. Like you're doing that incrementally, basically. And that's yeah, definitely something to have in mind. Because sometimes when I teach patient stats, uh, you know, I get uh, too enthusiastic and <laughs> want to tell people about, oh, you can do that and you can do that and you can do that, etc. But I think that's not the best way. Uh, that definitely subcommunicates passion and enthusiasm, but that can like make people even more overwhelmed than they used to be <laughs> so than they already are. Sorry. So that's an interesting approach you have here. And actually, I'm, and of, of course, I, I put links, by the way, in, in the show notes to BRMS and, and Bambi for people who want uh, to check that out. PRMS is in R, Bambi is in Python. And also we have episode 35 of Learning Bayesian Statistics where Paul Birkner came on the show, creator of PRMS, came on the show and we talked about all that. So I refer people to that. Let's continue talking about teaching is something I was wondering is how did the switch to remote teaching challenged all that like did it change the way you had to engage with students and the way you had to 
get to know them or or not? Absolutely, it did. It was really interesting because we switched, at least here in California, right in the middle of our semester. I think we were about six weeks into it and Hmm. it changed a ton. I mean, I am excited to go back in person because I think there are some things that are lacking, especially in a nice way. Peer pressure was really lacking over uh, Zoom and hybrid education because typically people would be kind of like pressured by their friends or just kind of generally by living in a society to participate in class. Whereas when your camera is off on Zoom, you really have to, one, account for students who just won't participate because they're not feeling peer pressured over Zoom, and two, make things more engaging so that students feel like when they want to engage, there's someone else to engage with. So that was a huge change. But one thing that came out of the pandemic teaching and hybrid situation that we did was offline and asynchronous communication got so much better. So our department uses Slack. So I created a Slack workspace for my students. And that went really well because not only was it a good way for them to communicate with me and easier to keep track of than emails, it also provided a way for them to communicate with each other because they could create groups in our Slack workspace. They could find friends, find project partners. And then of course, I would have channels like we have a meme channel (laughs) in my Slack where we all post our (laughs) Of course, of course, we all post our good stats memes. Mostly it's me asking them to find me hilarious. But I have always a couple handful of students that will <laughs> really get into it and create some of the best stats memes that I've seen. And that has been incredible. And I think that I want to continue that as time goes on and we come back in person because I realized that, you know, students are adults, they have their own lives, they're often working. And having a little bit more flexibility with them is incredibly impactful. It makes their lives easier. It makes my life easier. But in terms of content, I think that it was a huge switch because it was easier for them, as I mentioned before, to disengage. And so the way that I teach my classes, even before the pandemic, is typically as a flipped class. So they'll watch their lectures at home. And then in class, we do 10, 15 minutes of review lecturing. And the rest of the time is guided activities that I design specifically for the topics. And usually, like when (laughs) everyone's in person and there's not a huge global pandemic going on, students can really handle a lot of hands-off activity like that, where they're, you know, spending an hour digging into the questions, discussing them with their groups, and then coming back to me and asking questions. But I think that over Zoom especially, I had to chop things up a lot more because attention spans are just not conducive (laughs) to being on Zoom. But overall, I think because I was doing flipped classes, it actually worked pretty well. There's obviously students who it doesn't work for personally, but it worked pretty well because then students were able to have a good experience regardless of, you know, if their internet connection was great or their work schedule was good or they were having a lot of anxiety. And so I think it like really opened, it opens up the class to be a little bit more accessible. So that was a really cool thing to see have a little bit more impact during the pandemic. But yeah, to wrap it up, I'm very excited for there to be peer pressure to participate (laughs) when we come back in the fall. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, in a nutshell, and I noticed that in not only in education, you know, but in a lot of big corporations and so on, where remote work was kind of frowned upon and looked down, actually. It's, it was the case a lot in France. I'm very happy for this. Like one of the positive side effects of this COVID crisis is, is that I think we'll make much better use of what technology is providing us. I mean, that doesn't mean that we have to do everything online. We have to do everything remote. But I think a mixed model, again, like, like you go, you go to the university, but you also have remote interactions and all these, exactly what you talked about with the Slack channel, et cetera. You have more access actually to the professors. You can ask questions in a different context. And also it's written. It's not a question that someone goes and asks to you at the end of the class because she was, you know, shy of asking it in front of the class because she could be shamed if it's not a smart question. But it's a question that a lot of people are asking themselves, then she will write that in Slack and oh, uh, everybody can read that. That's great. And we were under using all 
that technology can can teach us and and can offer us sorry and i'm happy with that because it gave everybody an incentive to just get out of the status quo and and see what you could do and and be more creative with what we've got right now because i'm a huge fan of, of technology helping people get educated that's basically how i got educated to, to patient statistics. So, I mean, you can do that. And, and we use that all the time in open source development. So it's great that these different tools are now used by a much wider audience. Yeah, and it makes things more accessible. For instance, I even think my school is yeah. allowing us to continue to do Zoom office hours because I've never had so much office hour participation as when it's on Zoom because they no longer have to come to campus. Yeah. And because I don't have to come to campus, I can offer Same for better, you. Yeah, yeah, I can offer better hours. So I really love the increased accessibility. And I hope that continues because sometimes you see a little bit of pushback where people are like, okay, things are back to normal. But I'm really hoping that people will continue to push for that higher accessibility because it just made such a good experience for a lot of people. Yeah. Really here, it's really a mixed model. Like <laughs> use both and like use the best of both actually. But best of the both interactions. That's the goal. Actually, let's let's take um continue talking about that, but more in even more practical terms. Let's say that I'm a stats beginner or someone in your classes and I would like to emulate the work you do. So which skills should I develop and which mistakes should I make, <laughs> not avoid, but make to learn best? Mm, that's a wonderful question. I would say to start off with the skills that you need if you wanted to truly emulate my work, would I think be to have a more broad skill set that focuses a lot on communication and empathy? I always say this to my students and hopefully they're not sick of hearing it. <laughs> but I think that <laughs> communication is often overlooked in introduction classes if you're learning statistics or learning data science. It's not really mm -hmm. seen as a skill that you need to teach in that context. People often go like, well, they'll they'll learn elsewhere or they'll figure it out on their own. And I don't think that's true. I think we have to be ingraining communication, how to communicate, especially with people outside of your field, because it's one thing to be able to talk to another expert about something. It's an entirely different ball game to try and explain it to someone who has no idea what you're talking about. And so embedding communication and empathy and respect for other people's work, I think is really important in being a link between fields, as we talked about before, because often people in research that are not statisticians can sometimes experience statisticians and data scientists as being a little bit condescending or not valuing the domain expertise that those people bring. And so if you want to connect worlds, you really have to respect and be able to communicate with both worlds. Other than that, I would say that I've really benefited from having a wide range of knowledge. Obviously, you know, that saying of there's a jack of all <laughs> trades, master of none can be problematic in times when people need you to be like the number one expert in something. But getting a little bit of experience in a ton of different fields, I think helps you think a little bit better about what methods should be used and what might be a good tool for that situation. So if someone were starting out, I would say, obviously, at first, you're going to be learning the basics of inferential statistics, of Bayesian statistics. But once you have a little bit of a solid ground, branch out as much as you can, because I think some of the most useful tools I've learned are not necessarily things that would be the focus of an introductory pathway to statistics. For instance, item response theory has been incredibly useful to me, and it was not something that people mentioned ever. <laughs> or for instance, like, you know, it's quite common, but not in psychology, using machine learning models or unsupervised machine learning has been really cool to be able to learn about all of these different methods and then bring them in when it's appropriate to a field that maybe doesn't use them a lot. So to summarize, I would say, make sure you're good at empathy and communication. And also once you have the basics down, get a broad range of experience because the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better you can be at connecting people with a tool that fits the question that they're asking. Yeah, love that. And also, can you quickly define 
item response theory yeah, first? Yeah, absolutely. So item response theory is essentially an extension of a logistic regression model, at least in its basic forms, where mm -hmm. we say that the response that we observed, so you can think, for instance, of a spelling test, whether someone got a question right or not, is the product, both the difficulty of the item and the ability of the person. And those two things interact to create the response that we observed. So item response theory models just basically explicitly model that. So you can think of it as having item effects as well as person level effects. But then they can obviously get a little more complicated. So they're usually used on questionnaires or tests or things like that. Like, for instance, things like the GRE, the SAT, standardized tests like that are often mm -hmm. um, evaluated using yeah. IRT models. And so they can get more compl complicated. For instance, one of the common models that I use in IRT will also have a term for each item and how well it discriminates between people who are good versus bad at something. So you can add more parameters, but the general gist of it is that we are taking parameters for the item and taking parameters for the person and looking at the interaction of them to generate the response that we observe for the survey or the test that we're looking at. Uh, yeah, that sounds super interesting. <laughs> and I'm guessing that Michael Lee is working on these kinds of models. Yeah, like, a lot he? of people are more so now. And I know that Paul Berkner, our friend, has a lot mm -hmm. of papers, I believe, maybe not a lot, maybe at least mm -hmm. one. <laughs> looking at a little bit like how we use IRT. Also, I mean, honestly, if you're looking to learn Bayesian statistics, anything that he writes is golden. I used some of his papers also for the ordinal regression models that I used in my dissertation. So highly recommend. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, same question as for zero-inflated PT regression. Do you have some resources that we could ha add to the show notes about item response theory for people who want to dig deeper? Absolutely. I was actually just asked about this on Twitter. I have some. I don't know them off the top of my head, but I will absolutely send them to you so you can link them in the show notes. I will say there awesome. are less resources out there than you would expect <laughs> that are approachable mm -hmm. IRT resources, but certainly people are building them and I will send you the ones that I think are good. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And Actually, since we are speaking of mistakes to make, if you want to learn, I'm wondering if you have in mind a big model of mistakes that you made one day and how did you realize it and in the end solve it? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have any great theoretical mistakes that I have discovered, but I tweeted about a while ago that just like the most embarrassing mistake that I made is I was running a Bayesian model. It doesn't necessarily have to do with that. But I accidentally deleted one cell of a CSV that had some population values for, I think we were looking at schools or something like that. So it had a bunch of demographic information. Mm -hmm. I deleted one of the cells and ran my model and didn't notice and wrote up the entire results section with that missing value. And when I realized that that had happened, I was like, oh no, I think that there's a value missing here. I'm just going to put it back. Maybe no one will notice. No, it actually changed the entire analysis and we had to rewrite the entire <laughs> results and discussion section. And I literally only figured it out because we were going over the results. And this was not an area of my expertise, like the domain was not my area of expertise. The domain experts were like, hmm, this looks a little bit different than we would expect. Like, can we do a little bit more follow-up? And that's the only reason that we caught that error was because the domain experts realized that it wasn't matching with their expectations and beliefs. Obviously, that can happen. We always update our beliefs with a response to new information. But in this case, it was a really great check. And I think going back to what I was talking about before is one of the reasons that we have to really respect the knowledge of domain experts because they know so much more than us. And it's not that our knowledge of methods is better than their knowledge of the domain. And when those two things come together, you get a lot more careful, obviously, because we could have accidentally published something completely wrong. Um, you get a lot more careful and like well thought out models. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, I get that. I, yeah, from my experience too, I think the most sneaky mistakes are related to data cleaning. Yeah. Something or like that. 
you'd have. Oh, sorry. Or copy and paste. I was writing a different model for, I, I basically, I think I ended up calling it like a multinomial Dirichlet model, but I was basically looking at the difference in proportion hmm. between like a, a simplex for two groups. And I was trying to figure it out because no one had the code up to do exactly what I was trying to do. And I couldn't figure out why my results were null all the time. And I was like, I see a big effect in like my data visualization. Why is this happening to me? (laughs) And I even called my friend Dimitri, who I believe you've had on the show. And I was like, hi, can you help me? Like, I don't understand why this isn't working. And he was like, did you copy and paste your like priors or something? So I was using the same vector for both groups, even though they should be different. And we were looking at the posterior for the difference between the two simplices. (sighs) Copy and paste will get you every time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, definitely. These these, (laughs) mistakes are awful. You can lose hours. I did. (laughs) Days. Like banging your head against the walls because of that. Mm, Yeah. And I'm absolutely not talking about from personal experience. (laughs) Never. (laughs) Not at all. (sighs) Okay, uh, it's going to be time to wrap up. But um, I had so many more questions. Uh, You'll have to come back on the show uh, for for actually for a matchmaking dinner. I think uh, the other format I have for for patrons of the show. Very cool. And one quick question before I ask you the the last question is so you said that you work out on psychology data and so I'm wondering what are the current main challenges you know in this field uh, nowadays like the frontiers of research if you will what are people most interested in these days and what are the the modeling problems that they are uh, having? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm sure a lot of statisticians wouldn't find this interesting, but when I do consulting or when I'm on a project, the same things come up over and over and they tend to be things like sparse models so model or variable selection Mm. like we talked about earlier also people are often interested a lot in using mixed effect models and don't quite know how to define the structure that they have for instance i recently had a consultation where they did a survey and sometimes people that took the survey were in the same family as other people that took the survey and so we talked about like hierarchical effects and how you can use random effects and nesting to account for that covariance structure, that tends to come up a ton. Is like, I want to use a random effects model. How? Question <laughs> mark. And then a lot of times I also get people who are quite good at statistics on their own, but want to transition into Bayesian statistics. So I've had a lot of really cool consultations where people will show me a model that they've built in a frequentist framework, and we work together to figure out how to build it in a Bayesian framework. So I'd say those three things come up at least in my current experience, the most frequently. Sounds like you have interesting work (laughs) ahead of you. That's great. Okay, time to wrap up now. But before letting you go, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. First one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would try and solve the problem of stats education. If someone was willing to pay me to do so, I would love to be a statistics content creator who just creates approachable content that is also rigorous because there's often a gap Um, And I've even been part of this gap. For instance, a couple of years ago, I wrote the Crash Course Statistics series on YouTube with Crash Course. And that was just very beginner, very intro level. But then I've also been commissioned to write things that are very complicated, like what do we do with convolutional neural networks and how can we apply them and what is weight sharing and stuff like that. And there tends to be a missing piece in between where it's people who maybe know a little bit about the basics or have a background in math, but aren't ready for instance, for diving into all of the math and coding that comes with some of these more complicated problems. So if someone was willing to give me unlimited resources, pay me to do this, I would love to be a content creator that looked at that middle section and said, hey, here's a method that's too complicated for intro stats and AP stat centric people, but is a little bit less complicated than some of the textbooks or writings on that area. So someone, if you're out there and want to pay me to do that, please do. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can completely relate to that. I love doing that too. Yeah. But as you say, the problem is 
getting paid、mm-hmm. for that.、Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I love that. Like when I have to write educational content for, for PyMC or、uh, PyMC Labs, sometimes for some workshops, a l s that's, I enjoy that so、that's、much. So, so, yeah, definitely with unlimited time and resources. <laughs> that's, I, I love your answer. Second question if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it Ooh, be? Who are fictional? That is a wonderful question. I can it be like all of them? <laughs> I think people have such great diverse perspectives. I mean, I would really love to have dinner with someone who was at the beginning of their field because I think one thing that can sometimes be a little frustrating is that our fields have gotten so deep and so wide that even when you say, oh, I'm a Bayesian statistician. You probably have a narrow area of expertise because it's just so deep and there's so much to learn. So, someone like Ada Lovelace, who was the beginning of computing, or, well, I suppose Thomas Bayes himself may not actually be the most interesting <laughs> to talk to, but someone who is a little bit more、yeah. at the beginning of the implementation of these methods would be fascinating. And also, personally, I have had dinner with him many times. My grandfather is a mathematician and worked a lot on linear. Algebra applications in computer science. And he and I have had some really fascinating conversations about why we implement methods certain ways in computers that have nothing to do with the actual theoretical math and everything to do with the hardware、mm-hmm. and the limitations of computers. And so while I can have dinner with him anytime, someone like that would be fascinating because I'm always interested in. You know, we teach linear regression, for instance, as least squares. It's projection of higher dimensional onto lower dimensions. But we technically don't do the computation that way when we do it in a computer. And sometimes that can be confusing for people one way, and then they learn that their computer does it a different way. So talking to someone like that and getting a lot more of the You know, depth of reasons of like why stability matters or why this method is a little bit better would be fascinating. So I gave you three. Can it be a dinner party instead? <laughs> Definitely. That sounds, that sounds like fun to me. You know, that's actually one of my goals one of these days to organize a real、mm. patient dinner. Oh my goodness. You often invite of hundreds of people. <laughs> And listeners, exactly. That would be so awesome. It's, it's going to be like the probability that it happens is much higher now that we're all vaccinated than it was six months、True. ago. So <laughs> I am optimistic. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chelsea, for coming on the show and telling us all about psychology data and stats education. I learned a lot, even about like. Uh, zero one inflated beta <laughs> regression stuff like that. I, I, I love learning about all these different methods. And thank you for the work you do in communicating patient stats in a funny, nerdy <laughs> way. I think it's exactly what we need. And actually, we talked about that in episode 38 with Baba Brinkman, who is the rapper who wrote and performed the Good patient song that you all hear in, in the introduction to the show. And yeah, we talked about that, like content for nerd. <laughs> And so that's an interesting listen if people want to go back to that. So yeah, as usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Chelsea, for taking the time and being on this show. Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm finally one of the cool Bayesians, as I have said before, that all of them are on this show. And finally, I'm part of the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, come back anytime. This has been another episode of Earning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country, 
you can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good baby and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good baby and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.